we'll, we'll get started. Um, I'm sure people start straggling in a little bit, but thank you everybody for coming today. Um, I'd like to first of all thank the Colorado School of Public Health and Dean Goff for sponsoring our session today and for sponsoring our lunch. So please be sure to grab some sandwiches and we have some oranges and cookies. Um, so please feel free to grab that. Um, also, please sign in. There's sign-in sheets at the end of the um, rows here. Uh, so please just sign in. And then um, I just want to announce, so our next Grand Rounds next month is March 3rd. Um, and we will be having a visiting lecture from Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, um, Dr. Keisha Pollock. And her talk is going to be on inequalities in the built environment and implications for obesity prevention. Um, so we will have lunch as well at that session. So invite everyone to come. Um, but so our speaker today is Dr. Eric France, um, who we know well in our residency. He uh, teaches a class for us and some of our residents rotate with him. Um, but he's the Director of Population Care and uh, Prevention Services for the Kaiser Permanente Colorado region. And the department basically works to improve the health of members through chronic disease management, prevention programs, and worksite health uh, management, and builds tools such as um, registries and reminder systems to aid in this work. Um, he's a graduate of McGill Medical School, and he did residencies in both pediatrics and preventive medicine here in Colorado. And he's associate clinical professor of preventive medicine here at the University of Colorado. So we welcome Dr. France and look forward to his talk. Thank you. Glad you're all here. Um, you're all here because you're part of the School of Public Health in some way. And uh, if you didn't know it already, there's a requirement that if you are in public health, you have to ride a bicycle. So uh, if you don't know how to ride a bicycle, we should probably have a class on that. I was teaching a course here um, maybe 18 months ago, and Dr. Berman from the Denver Health Department showed to give the lecture. And this was in the evening. and uh, I'm, I'm imagining where Denver Health is at 7th and Bannock, and he shows up with his bike gear on. I'm like, whoa, you rode all the way out here? And he said, yeah, it's a requirement. If you're in public health, you have to ride your bicycle. So uh, he's a good model, and we all need to uh, both talk about public health and physical activity, and we have to model it by riding bicycles ourselves. So there's really two things I think I'll focus on today and maybe a third. And uh, the, the, the first will be about... Um, knowing what we know about physical activity and the importance of uh, physical activity to a long and healthy life in communities, how can a community um, transform itself over time so that it's more propitious or, or bending towards uh, physical activity through walking and bicycling? I'll use the example of cycling uh, for this talk, but in many ways you'll see uh, walking it has a lot of the same principles. Secondly, as public health people, we will need to engage our communities and have conversations with them about why it's important for our communities to undergo this transformation. And the way we speak about um, public health and, and physical activity will have a, a direct impact on our success. So I'm going to show a short video of, of um, me talking about cycling on Bike to Work Day. So, and we can all tear it apart because I did it completely wrong. And then we'll talk about the way we should be preparing ourselves to have these conversations. Finally, if time allows, we'll take a few minutes and we'll talk about you as individuals and what, what you should know if you want to ride your bicycle in the city so that you can, too, model this important behavior. The first slide here shows, uh, as a title slide, this happy, smiling woman who's on a bike ride and um, ready to enjoy her day. And so there's certainly an aspect of riding that's really about uh, en uh, enjoyment. Uh, if you want instead to ride in the city, sometimes uh, it can be more of a challenge. Uh, think about this gentleman, um, who happens to be me, uh, trying to do the right thing as a public health person, uh, leave the car behind, reduce air emissions, get a routine physical activity as part of my, my day, um, reduce congestion, uh, reduce traffic, and yet there's this battle that is, is in front of us. And as uh, Jim Salas, who's a, uh, uh, a specialist in San Diego, I think, who, who, who leads the nation with active living research, says, we are spending many billions of dollars every year to build severe and long-lasting barriers to active living. So um, it can be quite a challenge to think about how one can incorporate this in one's life. 
when when one comes to, to speak about public health and cycling, um, we do what we always do. We start pulling up the articles. What can we find out? What do we know about cycling and health? And how can I tell you about what that looks like? Well, um, as you've learned through your training, um, there's a variety of quality of evidence based on the methodologies that were used. And clearly, the big issue for this kind of research, um, which is, for the most part, observational. We don't have a lot of randomized experiments where people are assigned to ride a bicycle or not ride a bicycle. So instead, we're looking at um, the the data that we're seeing from people's experience. And someone like me who chooses to ride a bicycle on a routine basis is unlike someone who doesn't choose to ride a bicycle on a routine basis. If something happened, we had a new dictator, and somehow I was never allowed to ride a bicycle again, I still would have a different health profile for the next 20 years than people who were not riding the bicycle at the time that that came forward. So I think the best we can say, really, is that we should pretend to be a routine cyclist. And I have a quote here from Kurt Vonnegut that's always stuck with me. We are what we pretend to be, so we must be careful what we pretend to be. So I would say that in, in, in engaging people about the value of cycling, you might say, well, pay attention to who rides and ask yourself, how can I be more like them? Um, from a health perspective, when you do look at these observational studies, you find that people who are routinely cycling have half the rate of heart attacks than people who don't cycle. Uh, in Denmark, 28% lower all-cause death, so death for any reason, when this cohort was followed for 15 years. And here in the United States, uh, certainly associated with uh, lower weight gain. These associations are also seen uh, at the community level. So in this diagram, you have the percentage of trips by bicycle on the x-axis and the percentage of adults who are obese on the y, and you see that in, in each of those dots represents a country, and in those countries where 50%, 30 to 50% of, of trips are by bicycle and foot, they have much lower rates of obesity. Again, that could be true and true and unrelated because it's, uh, that, that's what we have for, for, for information when it comes to helping us understand this. But we all know, um, that physical activity, we have a lot of research to date showing that physical activity reduces high blood pressure, obesity, heart disease, diabetes, osteoarthritis, a lot of the cost drivers. So we can feel pretty confident in saying that anything we can do to create a community where more people are physically active would be a good thing. Um, in, in recent years, there's been work to focus on obesity prevention in children and um, built environment in, in, impacts of, of obesity. Um, these are six of them that have been reviewed by the CDC, by the Institute of Medicine, by the RWJ Foundation. And you see that supporting walking, supporting cycling, citing a school centrally where kids can walk to them rather than on the outside of school, uh, the city where people have to drive their cars, access to public transit, parks, and having safe traffic are all, are all areas that are, are considered built environment strategies for obesity. So, so certainly cycling is right in there. Enrique Peñalosa was the mayor of Bogota, Colombia some years ago, and he was here in 2008 to talk about how he closed the streets off to make them more accessible for cycling. And he started off his conversation by talking about the Declaration of Independence and the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. And um, in his view, um, uh, there is a public good that we are creating in our societies, a public good of happiness. And the public realm of the city, therefore, is a place that one should be thinking about what does one create for the public. Indeed, a city is a means to a way of life, so we must start by deciding how we want to live. Uh, in the 1930s and 40s, maybe these weren't proactive, transparent decisions, but the automobile was the city that we wanted to build. So we have a 50-year history of building suburbs, building uh, uh, car-based uh, uh, neighborhoods. And today we find ourselves saying, is there another public good um, of happiness that we should be, be building for our communities? And that might be one that's more walkable and more bikeable.
I spent 2010 in the summer learning a bit more about what the city of Portland did to make itself more bike friendly. Uh, in 1994, Portland looked very much like Denver in terms of its rideability or bikeability. And over a 15-year period, it has transformed itself, itself so now it's known as a very bike-friendly city where 7% of the population uses their bike routinely to get in uh, for, for their commute, for instance. And in Denver, it's about 2%. And while I was there, I talked with many different people, and, and, and was, I was at Portland State University in the Urban Planning Department, and um, I realized that their history involved what I called the virtuous circle of community change. And um, there is this idea in economics about a virtuous circle, that a company sells a product, people buy the product, people like the product, they buy more, I then hire more people, more of my product goes out, and there's just this virtuous circle that builds on itself uh, of economic prosperity. And this should be considered in the same way. It's this ongoing loop of improvement. So as public health people, we should be aware of this, of this loop and think about it as we think about our roles in improving the communities we live in. Um, I'm going to go through for the next 10, 15 minutes what these different components look like. So oftentimes you find that cities will begin by uh, building some new bike facility or pathway. Um, and so this is something that's usually visible and large. And in some ways, it's like a catalyst. If you think of the pure, pure meaning of a catalyst, it just speeds something up. So you go from a place where people aren't really doing much to all of a sudden people doing a whole lot with a bicycle because of this one big thing you built. Um, here's an example. Portland has a number of uh, bridges that come across into the downtown area. And they spent uh, uh, over a million dollars to expand this walkway and bikeway on the side of one of the bridges. And all of a sudden, you have 12,000 cyclists crossing the bridge every day. Uh, this is their uh, East Bank Esplanade across the Willamette River. It runs along the side. It cost them over $4,000 a foot to build, but it linked the southern part of the city to the downtown area. And again, you have this sort of explosion of... Uh, of opportunity in cycling because it's a safe and comfortable ride. Here's a picture of one of these big events that we've done here in Denver. Three years ago, our bike sharing program took hold. Uh, it was um, funded by a million dollar gift from the Democratic National Convention that was here in town. The DNC uh, did have a small bike sharing program during the DNC and decided to, to give monies that then funded our own B-Cycle program. Um, the city of Denver now has 70 stations in the downtown area, um, 80 stations, I think, actually 700 bicycles, and um, they had maybe 200,000 uh, individual trips using these bicycles. So imagine uh, the day before, the summer before, people would be walking, people would be taking their car out of the parking lot to get to a meeting across town. Now they're incorporating physical activity in their routine by just hopping on a B-cycle. In 2013, they had over 300,000 bike trips. Um, so this is a big event that one can do. So it's one of these opportunistic building of a facilities as a place to start. Um, we're going to have a new Union Station development downtown. Uh, there's going to be bike parking down there. There's going to be some um, bike shops down there. And, and that will be part of this infrastructure that Denver will be building. The next thing you want to be sure you're doing is um, uh, creating an enjoyable experience for riding. And um, also what I call changing people's mental maps. So I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. So um, how many of you have ridden your bicycle this year, 2014? Well, look at that. There's a few folks here. That's nice. How many of you rode bicycles in 2013? Pretty good. How many of you are comfortable with saying in this room, I don't like bikes. I have no interest in riding bikes. Well, you're all here to hear about bicycling, so obviously you made some choices there. About a third of everybody in the community will say, I'm not really interested in bikes. About 1% um, about of them are, about, are strong and fearless. So these are the folks that are in the middle of the traffic. They take the lane. They're, you know, they don't care. They, they think they're a car. You know, they're, they're all right out there. 
And then there's a group called the Enthusiastic and Confident. So that, that's this group here. They'll, they'll ride bike lanes. Many of you are probably enthusiastic and confident. You're riding your bikes routinely. You see it as an opportunity to leave your car behind and use it for short trips. Um, and putting bike lanes down like this can create an enjoyable experience, in particular for the enthusiastic and confident. And it's not very expensive. So cities will start oftentimes by putting out the new bike lanes. And just seeing more people on the road starts to change the mentality of a city. Like, oh, people can ride their bikes. I'm seeing people, maybe I'll try riding my bike. So you get a certain benefit from just putting down bike lanes because then the enthusiastic and confident and the strong and fearless are going to be out on the road. I've heard it said by the traffic engineer in Portland that once about 5% of your, your population is riding routinely, it feels like a tipping point. People know that there, there are cyclists out there, and it's something to think about. There is, however, this other group, interested but concerned. That's my wife. Yeah, she likes to ride from now and then, but, but it's not like she's crazy like me about riding. So she's um, willing to do it, but it's got to feel safe. You know, she doesn't want to be out there with all those cars. A lot of these bike lines are pretty uncomfortable as well. So about half of the population you might consider interested but concerned. And as you do work in a community to make it more bike friendly, you actually pay more attention in some ways to the interested but concerned. They're the women, they're the children, they're the, the older folks, and they're like a, uh, what is the word, indicator species of an ecology. If you've gotten them to start riding, then you're really making some progress. And, and this is what was called, as a facility, it's called a bike boulevard. So you, you find these simple roads that we have in our towns, and you say, how can I use this asset even more? Uh, I'm going to put this bicycle shero that says these are, the bicycle goes here. There's some speed bumps. I'm going to turn the stop sign so that you don't have to stop every two blocks. I'm going to make the intersections more comfortable for the cyclist. And it's not very expensive, and it gets you uh, to a place where the interested and concerned folks are more likely to ride. So not interested is a third of the population. Interested but concerned about the safety is about half and they're the ones we want to get on. Then you have the confident and enthusiastic who are six to eight percent, and then the fearless who are in that top, top, top tier. Um, certainly the interested but concerned want to have safe facilities. And we use the phrase facilities to describe any kind of biking place. It could be a boulevard, it could be a, a separated track, it can be a bike lane, but when we say bike facilities, it's not where you go and shower or store your bike. It's like all these different um, uh, road possibilities. And this is actually in Denver. It was about maybe two years ago that we put our first separated bike facility. City and County of Denver building is over here, and the city, uh, that the, the park uh, where all the marijuana smokers is behind it there. And you see that this is actually now separated. This is Bannock Street, I think, here. And this is up on the pseudo sidewalk, because now the sidewalk is here, and this is for cyclists. And 14th Street, 15th Street downtown, they're, they're putting in new bikeways down there as well. This one is called the cycle track, and you see these cars on the on the side are actually parked there, and then there's a striped white area where the doors can open and people can get out, and then here is where the cyclists ride. So you feel more comfortable and safe as a cyclist on a cycle track because you're separated from something that's very uncomfortable, which is the traffic moving. Uh, this is called the green box, and I think we're putting some of these in Denver as well. Cars stop here. That says wait here. You're riding on your bike lane. Then it turns green. And then at the stoplight, if it's red, you pull over in front of the car in that green box area. So here you have to teach the, uh, the drivers what a green box is as well. So there is a transition phase as you put some of these in. Um, and so uh, we, we spoke about engineering a comfortable experience. And you saw some of the different kinds of ways that a community can be doing that. The other thing is that you sometimes want to change people's what we call mental's, mental map, which is I don't really think of my bicycle. Like So if I'm going from my house to get a haircut, I go to Monaco Boulevard, I go south on Monaco, I get to Hot Parker, and... How would I do that on a bike? Because I'm not riding on Leedsdale and Monaco, you know? So I have a certain mental map 
about how I get to the where I get my haircut or how I go to pick up a movie at Redbox. And I don't see the map in my head that says, this is how you would do it to feel safe and comfortable on the bike. And uh, I remember when I was in Portland, uh, someone after, I'd been there six weeks or so, and someone said, we're going to, there's a lecture, it's on this street. And I'm like, I don't know where that street is. It turned out to be like the main thoroughfare, but because I had been on my bike the whole time, my mental map was about how one gets around on the bike. And I didn't even know the names that were mostly for the cars. So um, how do you do that? Well, you want to engage the population in, in riding and doing fun things and getting people on the bikes. This, um, this uh, Pedal Palooza is a two-week festival in Portland where they just say, you know, let's just self-arrange in a grassroots way a variety of rides that might be fun. Um, let's do WNBR, the World Naked Bike Ride. I don't think we'll do that here in, in Denver. Um, but maybe we'll do a Star Trek versus Star Wars rides where you, you dress up in your favorite um, Star Trek I'll dress up in my favorite Star Wars and we'll meet on the bridge at 2 o'clock next Wednesday. And so they have this website um, for Pedal Palooza where you can post the events you want to you wanna have on that day. And um, this is a great way just to get people out having fun on their bicycles. Um, this is one I did that was a, a, a tour of North Portland. The woman there has a, a baby carriage behind her bicycle and has a small speaker on it. She was telling us about the history of, of Portland, and she's speaking there in the middle. Um, another event that cities are doing now are called Ciclovias, where they actually close a street down and make it available to the community for cycling and walking and having a party. I mean, this is an asset owned by the people, the street, and yet we relegate its use to cars. And so why not close it? and make it more available to the people. When you do that, you help them understand, oh, I can ride my bike on, on this street or this street next to me and get to my grocery store. Um, and so it helps start changing people's mental maps. So uh, we have a program called Viva Streets. This was in Park Hill. Now they're doing it in Northwest Denver, but they close the street off in the summer. And um, in, in some cities, they do it every weekend, uh, every Sunday in New York, every Sunday in Chicago. San Francisco, where they close the street down so people are comfortable riding their bicycle. I haven't ridden my bike in a long time. I don't know if I want to get out on there. There's cars. Well, this is a very comfortable place to pull your bicycle out and give it a try. Um, this bike shop might be very comfortable for the enthusiastic cyclist, but if you're sort of interested and concerned, it's a bit daunting to walk in there and seeing all this stuff kind of hanging there. So even the infrastructures of, of cycling, like uh, the shops and, and, and the um, parking, for instance, might be something to think about. Uh, here's a bike commuter store, or at Portland State they have the bike hub, which is sort of like a co-op, and you feel comfortable going in there and saying, I don't know anything about bicycles, but I thought it might be fun to ride. Can you help me? And you don't feel like you're, you're an idiot like you sometimes do if you wanted to go to one of our fancy bike shops. Uh, cities will actually pull out parking spots, so they lose some revenue, and they put in these bike corrals instead so that you can p park a whole lot more bicycles. And this actually becomes very interesting to the local business because now they have a lot more people that are able to come and not worry about parking. And um, b local businesses start asking the city to take out more parking spots, which is uh, a very effective way at trying to um, help change a city. So uh, we talked about the facilities. We talked about in having an enjoyable experience with the kinds of facilities you put in, events that can help change mental maps and have people think about them in a different way. And the, and the goal there is that you're starting to increase the number of people who are actually riding. Well, now we need to tell these stories. And so there are a variety of methods that are to used to actually count the number of riders. In Denver, if you go up to your friend and say, you know, tell me about riding in Denver. Is it a good place to ride? They'll say, oh, I live in Park Hill, and I can ride my bike to my work in Golden, and the trails are great. And, and then if you say, well, do you ever just take your bike to go to the barber shop? And they're like, Oh, you know, I have to get my shoes, my special clipping shoes, and no, I don't really ever do that. So there is a mental map of from cycling in Denver where people typically talk more about our trail system than they do about using it for short trip transportation. And this is clear when I did some bike counts some years ago along the Cherry Creek Trail, where over an hour, over 163 people on a Saturday morning 
in October were actually riding back and forth. So Denver's kind of a view of, of cycling tends to be spandex trails rather than street clothes, uh, riding to work and riding to go get a bite to eat or something. Measurement can be very helpful because it then allows politicians to talk about what's going on. So this is a tube counter you see at the bottom across the bridge. Easy in Portland because everybody comes in on these bridges and they can actually count how many riders come through. And the orange represents the number of miles of trails and, and bike lanes they have. And the white is the number of people they count over the tube counts. And in 2008, there were almost 17,000 people a day that were riding their bicycles. So being able to take this to city council meeting and saying, look what's happening because of the infrastructure changes you're meeting. This is reducing congestion downtown. It's improving business downtown. It's creating a more walkable public realm uh, because cars are driving slower with bicyclists around. So you want to be able to tell stories, you want to be visible, and then this can then build a certain uh, advocacy and, um, uh, I'm sorry, a constituency that advocacy groups then can then use, gets the business engaged. And um, this uh, popular support for bicycling that can then lead to more of a, a political spend of, of capital. You know, here in Denver, the, the advocates for cycling might go to city council, go to the, the mayor and say, we need more bike lanes, we need more of these separated streetways. And the mayor's like, you know, should I spend my political, political capital on these loudmouth cyclists? Well, it's, it's harder not to pay attention when there's a real um, a popular support for cycling. So you see how this loop comes around to build more riders, then it makes it a lot easier for the politicians to make decisions. So even today in Denver, compared to five years ago, there's a lot more going on. Yeah. Yes. So the question, I'll repeat it for the recording, is about what about these sort of angry confrontations that can occur between cyclists and, and people in cars? And how does a city like Portland and other places manage that? Well, at the extreme, you have the cities in Europe where 30 to 50 percent of people are riding bicycles. And what happens when you're at that extreme is that the people who are driving cars Oftentimes they're cyclists, or their grandmother's a cyclist, or their child's a cyclist. And so there are fewer of these kinds of confrontations. You'll also see that people at those, in those cities typically don't wear bicycle helmets when they ride. And um, they have fewer injuries than we do in the States because everybody's sort of aware that there are bicyclists around, and I have to be careful. When you go from a, a community where there's very few cyclists to one that's trying to increase cyclists, I think there's a phase you go through where you have to get to a place where the cars are, are now going to be aware that, that there are cyclists around. But until you get there, there's actually opportunities for injuries at an increased rate. And I think even this last year in Denver, 2013, we had a number of fatalities and injuries. And it almost felt like compared to five years ago where we didn't have very many, there weren't very many cyclists, the numbers are going up. Now there's more of these events. And we have to get over the hump to a place where the cars are now saying, oh, OK, there are so many bicyclists. I need to be more aware of that. So um, we also talk about in cycling the five E's, engineering, engineering a great experience, encouraging, encouraging cyclists, as we talked about through these kinds of events, education. So it's a lot of education in both drivers as well as cyclists. Um, evaluation, which is counts, so we can talk about stories, and, in, and, and enforcement. So there's, there's clearly a role for enforcement. Enforcement for ticketing cyclists who blow through red lights and stop signs. Enforcement for cars who are, are, who are driving in a risky way. So yes, there is that. And the more you create safe and comfortable rides where it's clear this is where bicycles go and this is where cars, cars go, uh, you'll also uh, sort of avoid some of that as well. Um, so let me just go back here. So now we're going to work a little bit on spending 
capital. And Denver has a program called Denver Moves, which was about mapping out how you build more trails that are link, uh, uh, bike lanes and so on, what our plan will be for the city to get towards something that's um, uh, more, of a, more of a plan for the city for cycling. And there's really been quite a bit uh, done over the last five years. I was, uh, I admit, watching Channel 8, a nerd that I am, and Denver government was talking, the city council was talking about Brighton Road, which is downtown. If you follow Broadway north, it turns into Brighton along the Platte. And there's all a bunch of this new development. And all the city council people were saying, we have to have a separated bike facility with cars here parked and, and a separate one right next to it. 15th Street downtown, right next to the, the Center for Performing Arts, is going to have its own separated bikeway now as is 14th. So there's a lot happening in the city. But it all comes from having a plan. We don't quite have a master plan yet in Denver. Um, these are long, so this is a 20-year master plan, uh, but it provides a clear vision about where the city wants to go. And you have to amass a certain amount of support before the political capital is spent to say, we're going to have a master plan. And this master plan is going to say things like a quarter of people are going to be riding on their bicycles. Half of trips less than three miles will be taken by bicycle. I mean, there, there are, there are always going to be compromises, right? Some folks will want these roads, uh, expanded, but instead that money is going to be used to build in these separated bikeways. As you can imagine, any of this bicycle, bicycle facility stuff is way cheaper than building a road. So, what can we say about this? Well, you have to have a clear vision and measures directing where you want to go by when. Take the long view. As public health people, we're working towards building master plans. Master plans today will be for now until the year 2040. You want to see built environment issues, health issues, parks, walking, and cycling to be part of that. You want to build a great experience um, in the way you build it so that more people will feel safe and comfortable. Encourage people to think about uh, how to use the bicycle for these trips because it's not in their current mental maps. Um, you, you, building this culture through events, uh, celebrations, uh, street closures, that creates a lot of that, that support of it. And so don't, don't think it's all about engineering. It's also about teaching safe routes to school, to elementary school students. It's about engaging local nonprofits with events. And that's as, that's as important as the stuff we're doing to build them. Um, measure your success, accrue political capital, capital and, and make it easy for the politicians to spend that capital on sometimes difficult choices. So now I want to move into a, 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 a little piece where we'll talk for 10-15 minutes about you as public health people. How are you going to talk to somebody? I mean, here we are in Colorado. You are up in Brighton. You're up in Thornton, Greeley. You're facing a conservative city council and you're going to go there and you're going to talk about how important physical activity is for the health of your communities. And we ought to be doing more to build bike lanes. And um, it turns out that if, if you go talk to somebody about um, the importance of physical fitness, physical activity, um, as soon as we start talking about that with somebody, it triggers off, just like those mental maps, it triggers off a certain framing of what fitness means to the person you're talking to. And this is sort of the science of communications, which I'm not expert in. But there are people who, who just learn about the right way to do communications. And I would have you look at the Frameworks Institute, um, frameworksinstitute.org, as a source of, of, of learning more about how do you frame these kinds of public health conversations so that we're more effective. Um, Finding some familiar element causes us to activate the story that is labeled by that familiar element. And we understand the new story as if it were an exemplar of that old element, Roger Shank. So we are fast and frugal cognators. We're lazy. You know, if you're going to talk to me about fitness, boom, I'm going to fall back on my way of thinking about what it is. Well, what are the things that we think about if I want to go talk to somebody about trying to improve the fitness? Well, the first thing is, well, that's your individual responsibility. I take care of myself. I get up and work out and I eat. Uh, 
you should be responsible for yourself as well. And you're asking me as a governmental entity to somehow take on some of that? That's kind of nanny government, for one thing. Um, but, but physical fitness and individualism, the values of individualism, is something people fall back on right away. So you have a conversation with someone about changing the community, and it goes back to personal responsibility. We just got to change families. We got to help them be more personally responsible for what they're doing. Individualism is a big one. The other one is lifestyle. So, you know, you might be a cyclist, but I love to quilt. And I, I, I spend my hobby time as a quilter. And I'm happy that you like to bicycle. That's very quaint. That's nice. But that's your lifestyle choice. And I don't want you as a, you know, as, as a government, we're not going to create a city that somehow favors you and your hobbies of cycling with your spandex and whatever it is you all do. Um, what about my quilters? Shouldn't I be doing more for them, building community centers for quilting? Uh, the final one is about this idea of modernism, which is this view that it's inevitable that life is hard. So physical fitness, that's just, you know, it's kind of quaint in, in the sense that there's more traffic, there's more people, we've got computers now, we've got iPhones, we're going to sit around and do stuff. and. You know, we just have to let ourselves accept the fact that the modern world makes it difficult for us to do anything that's physically fit. So, with those three in mind, uh, individualism, lifestyle, and modernism, that's the lazy frame that people tend to fall back on when you as a public health person go and say, we have to make our uh, citizens healthier. We have to get them to be more physically fit. And I think we ought to be building bicycle ways to do it. And I'm like, oh, you know, really? I'm going to take uh, public health dollars and pay it for something. They should be responsible as an individual for their particular thing in a world where I can't really help the fact that we just need more cars. And, and so you don't get very far with, with that. So um, these frames can be a real problem for us if we are not aware of them. And so um, I'm going to show you a video now from the... Um, uh, bike to Work Day in 2012. Um, so, you know, I get a call, Dr. France, can you be at Channel 7 at 6 a.m. in two days to talk about Bike to Work Day? I'm like, oh, okay, love to do it. Great, you know, you know, a little, little nervous because I'm going to be on live TV, and you know, so I, I'm already just like, okay, what am I going to do? So. So then, in this video, there's a gentleman who's there with me. The two of us are talking. Jack is 83 years old. He lives in Cherry Creek, and he bikes to Arvada, where he, his, his office is. He has a business. So he's like biking 40 to 60 miles a day. And, and he sort of looks like me, and, and he's sort of a, a tall, white guy with silver hair, who's got his, he's got his head together, you know, he's a smart guy, and he's 83, and I'm thinking, geez, I want to be this guy someday, you know, this is, this is what it's all about, he's like the poster child for what I believe around um, the, the importance of physical activity and health, long life, contributing to society, engaged with his family, uh, all, and on and on. Uh, and so then this woman, she's asking me questions. And you'll see her ask me, I think, three questions in this little video clip. And in the first one, well, first you'll hear Jack talk. And he'll talk, and you'll notice he's talking. And you can hear sort of the framing of hobby, um, individual choice in, in the way he's answering. Then she asks me my first question. And uh, my responses are sort of in praise of Jack and his individual does desires to be physically fit. And it just sort of enhances this whole thing about individualism. Then she asks me about the history of cycling. And then I start talking about why cycling is important. And it's all about sort of a lifestyle, hobby kind of thing. And you can just see me, and this is what we do. We fall into these frames. I'm trying to be nice and trying to, uh, you know, have a smile and um, respond as I would expect to respond. Um, and, and you'll see me use very ineffective frames when I had this opportunity to be seen across the city to talk about cycling and how, it could, how, how we can change our communities. So let's start. You can tell I'm a mom of boys, right? We have boys. So Jack, how long have you been cycling? 
Well, about 38 years, seriously. I started writing at first as a child, because that's the only way we could get around. <laughs> and how often do you cycle? Do you find yourself doing it every single day? Not every single day. I try to come into the office two or three days a week. You have a life so, so 80 miles each way, so that you know, gets me 44 or 66 miles right there. And uh, it's... It's just refreshing to start the day that way. Well, I wish more and more people, I wish I would do something like that. And besides it being a refreshing way to start your day, what other benefits do you get from biking? Well, it's delightful to see the change of seasons. Yeah. The flowers, I mean, you know, the daffodils of the forest, the new and the flowers, and the iris, and then some of the, some of the ground color, and the, of course the trees blooming. And riding a bicycle, you can smell the, the, oh, uh, the blossoms crazy? on the trees. And it is so lovely. And sometimes you know it's coming up because you can smell it before you see it. And that's what Colorado is all about. And Doctor, obviously, he's doing a lot for himself, not just physically, but emotionally there. Absolutely right. And I think uh, Jack here is the poster grandfather for uh, routine cycling. Uh, physical activity is really the fountain of youth. It's one of the few things we know that you should be doing throughout your life. And cycling for short trips, you know, replacing your trip to the barber shop, replacing your trip to the library with a bicycle ride is a great way of incorporating daily activity in one's life. It's a great way, but it's also a very popular way. Why do you think so many people fell in love with the sport? Well, the sport's been around for over a hundred years, and it kind of waxes and wanes in terms of its popularity. It's certainly been uh, quite popular today. I think um, people see it as, as Jack said, fundamentally it's about having fun. Mm -hmm. And secondly, there's a lot of reasons, of environmental reasons, people think about it. Leaving the car at home, getting physical activity, uh, enjoying time with friends. It's all part of the, the cycling culture that's, that, that keeps us riding. And Denver does a great job encouraging it with the pathways and the roadways, and you're a big advocate of that, true? Absolutely. We, we're known for our trails and their access. And, and the opportunity for people to go rides. I think what's always more of a challenge is how do we ride through the city and how do we get where we want to go um, just on the back roads? Right. Do we know in our mind the, the way to get there? The more we can do to encourage people to include physical activity in their routines, we're going to be reducing their chances of heart attacks, diabetes, cancer. So it, it also can become a habit, as it has for Jack, so that it's not a burden or it's not a difficult thing to do every day. Right. And the result is many, many years of healthy life. And I think we all are hoping that we have that. Absolutely. And you... So, uh, uh, Jack was wonderful there. He talked about the joy that cycling brings to him. And um, I'm not going to take anything away from that. Of course, that's real. Um, and for me, you know, I, I was... I was ready to be positive and affirmative and and when you speak on the news you're not really being there wanting to be there to be confrontational and yet you heard me at the end you know at the beginning talk again more about his individual choices and then talk about the history of cycling there's this natural place and this was before i was thinking about the framing and so uh, is there a better way if you have such a large audience and you want to get people to be willing to invest in in a bikeable sydney city what else can we be doing well first remember that um uh, communications is storytelling. It's about telling stories. And so there's usually some values that you want to use to, that orients you to the big idea. It, you know, if you do this work and you're, you know, like running for office, you're going to have these simplifying models or stories and you always want to come back to what that simplifying statement is. Reasonable tone, re reinforcing visuals, you, you know, if it's, if it's about community cycling, then having, you know, white men in spandex on a bicycle on a trail is probably not the visual that you're going to use to talk about transforming a city. And then um, have stories that include a link between the cause and the effect. So. Um, we talked about the three frames of individual lifestyle and modernism. What are better frames? Well, um, this idea of a community rather than um, an individual is an important one. And so um, if we can talk about empowered communities that promote a quality of life where we're focusing on we as citizens rather than we as consumers or individuals, that is more important. So I'm talking 
be aware that if you're talking to someone about physical fitness, stay away from anything that's talking about individuals and instead use the framing and language of all of our citizens, all the people, the, our community as a whole. Um, we want to stay away from government as goad. You know, you should exercise. You should eat right. We want it more as, look, uh, a government already supports community choices. Communities come together and make decisions about uh, roads and how, how blocks are going to be built out. And this, certainly um, government is a given in this instance. And uh, schools are part of this government. And if we can bring in protection of kids as a frame, that's a, that's a nice frame that sort of plays well. Um, if, if you start talking about safety, sometimes it takes you down a rabbit hole. So it's just a caution that you might want to try and stay away from talking around safety. So here's an example of what a simplifying model might look like. And this is from the Frameworks Institute. Doctors say that in every town, workplace, and neighborhood in Colorado, it can be evaluated in terms of what we call the food and fitness environment. The food and fitness environment where we live or work is one of the most important things determining whether we end up fit and healthy or not. Some factors in the food and fit, fitness environment are fairly obvious, like access to pollution-free air, healthy food, and adequate health care. The number of bike paths, sidewalks, or fast food restaurants in an area also affects the overall state of public fitness. When we improve the food and fitness environment of a place, the health of the people who live and work there improves as well. So again, the, the whole point of this is that people have certain default frames. And if you're going to engage somebody, they're going to immediately go to their default frames. So your job in public health is to quickly put them at a different frame before they have a chance to fall back on the old one. Because the old one isn't working, and we need another one that might be more effective. So I need to have this in my mind when I go talk about Bike to Work Day. And I need to be ready to flip it from where the, the reporter interviewer is taking it to this kind of a frame that might be more effective at getting the key messages out. Values that would be underneath this include fairness, prevention, interdependence, and ingenuity. So as I'm telling a story uh, in, this, in this public health work, I want to focus on fairness. Some communities are struggling because they are not being given a fair chance to be healthy. Or prevention, you know, we should prevent further damage to communities' quality of life by helping it get in good shape. Interdependence, we'll succeed as a community only when all parts of it are in good shape. And this idea of ingenuity. Smart communities have been able to implement effective policies. So if I can bring in these values in my communication, these are ones that resonate with politicians and the public in general. So she asks me, doctor, he's doing a lot for himself, not just physically, but emotionally there. And then I go off and talk about him as being a strong individual and all that. Instead, I could have said this. He is. Experts tell us that the food and fitness environment is a strong predictor of the health of a community. And Jack is really fortunate to live in a city that has clean air, healthy food, and bike trails that are accessible to him. Some of our communities are struggling because they aren't being given a fair chance to be healthy. We need to encourage our local governments to make bike trails like the ones Jack uses available to all our citizens so that we can prevent further damage to our quality of life. So. If I had been a little wiser, I might have said something to this effect and had sort of planned it out a little bit better. Here are a couple of other example, examples. Denver bike sharing, more than 300,000 trips. Bike sharing gives all citizens in Denver, so fairness, opportunity. Um, the option of using a bike for transportation. Bike sharing program in Barcelona has been estimated to reduce deaths by 20% by improving fitness. It's a good example of how the ingenuity of our local community can come up with a solution to support food and fitness. The city can continue to support. So this is not as a goad, government as a goad, but go, a government as an enabler by building uh, engineering streets, providing comfortable experiences to the riders. So framing the way we talk around things is really important as well. So we have to think about our framing message. We want to think about the values that we want to include in our framing messages. 
we want to talk about communities environments rather than individual lifestyles and talk about solutions. What we don't want to do is focusing our conversations direct towards individuals. We don't want visuals that close in on individuals and pit groups one against the other, transit versus drivers, or focus on habits or choices such as lifestyles. So we've talked a bit about what cities do to transform. So as public health people, we ought to be thinking about that virtuous circle. We've talked about how we could actually communicate some of this with uh, our government folks. And now let's talk a little bit about what you can be doing when you ride your bicycle. Um, recognize that you are a model every time you get on your bicycle and accept that responsibility on yourself. All right? uh, you may want to go into some bad habits, but recognize just like we do with our children, we wear our, our ski helmet when we go skiing with our kids. We, we wear our bike helmet when we go biking with our kids. Um, we are people who are advocating for the health of public, and so our modeling is really important. So what are some few things just to, to, to help you think about your own cycling? Well, be predictable. Um, when, if there's a car behind you and you're out riding on the road, uh, it's always nice for the car to say, gee, he's been riding in a straight line, and I bet you I can predict that he'll continue to ride in a straight line. If instead, every time I go past a car, I go in, and then, you know, a parked car, I go over here for a while, and then there's another parked car, so I come back out here, and then I come back in. That's very unpredictable behavior, and so that it makes it more difficult for the, um, for the person who's driving their car. Be seen, of course, lots of lights, reflective tapes. You were required to have a, a red light on the back, and we should have a light in the front as well. Um, uh, reflectors and extra lights are always a good idea. Follow the rules of the road. Stop at stop signs. Stop at stop lights. Um, find a comfortable place to ride. Figure out where you need to go and what is a more comfortable uh, way to go so that you're not riding on Colfax to get here, for instance. There must be different other ways to get here. Um, you should know something about crashes because if you know something about crashes, you might be able to avoid them. Um, the first is that the, the rules in Colorado say you must ride as far right as is practicable. If there's a bunch of gravel and dirt and you worry that you're going to slip if you're in on the, as far right, then it's not practicable. I love saying that word. Uh, to, to be there. So go ahead and move over to the left. And you can actually be in the middle of the lane if, if it's uncomfortable for you to ride there. Um, when you ride and you're passing cars that are parked next to you, pretend there's another cyclist right next to you. And, and if this is a car right here, parked, and this is the door of the car, um, I'm going to ride far enough so that there could be another cyclist between me. Because if I'm here and somebody opens the door, I can get hit by that door. We call that being doored or dooring. And um, being aware that dooring happens can help you prevent it. Thinking about having a, an invisible cyclist next to you as you go by a parked car can help you. There's also something called uh, the right hook and the left cross. So if I'm riding down a street and a car comes behind me and this car is going to turn right at the next intersection, that car can misjudge how fast I'm going. And so it can come up and turn right right in front of me. So I, I know that that can happen. And so I'm going to be particularly mindful if a car is behind me that I don't want to be where he might turn right. So be aware of the right hook. The left cross is the car that's coming in front of you and turns left in front and could potentially hit you. So uh, the right cross and the left, the, the left hook, or the, the right hook and the left cross are, are two of the more common places where there's a misunderstanding between the cyclist and the bicycle. And um, of course, riding in the wrong direction. So if you're riding, um, um, the wrong way on a one-way street. That, that is another reason that people oftentimes are injured. Riding on the sidewalk is also a place where people can be injured because you have these cuts for people to turn in, and they're not necessarily expecting a cyclist on the, the sidewalk. And in Denver, it's actually illegal to ride on the sidewalk unless you're within 500 feet of your destination. You should be riding in the street. So that's it. Five minutes left. Any uh, specific questions you might have for me today about public health and our responsibilities around cycling? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, that's a great point. Right. So uh, just to I'll respond again, because we don't have the mics on, uh, the question was about, or the statement, I should say, was that when we're thinking about how we frame our, our communications, we have to think about our audience. And in particular, it was a couple of rich white guys that were answering the questions. And so our framing of examples was appropriate for other rich white guys rather than for who the audience might really be. And it does bring to, to light the issue that there are uh, uh, there's a the real disparities in ridership right now, and um, that goes to cultural differences. And um, you know, why don't we see more African American and, and Latinos riding bicycles? And and many of these cities are trying to engage uh, Latinos, uh, Asians, uh, um, African Americans in cycling. And it there's there's a variety of issues that are all specific and and uh, you know. There's no gross generalization, I should say. There's issues that, uh, in some places, if, if you ride a bicycle, it could mean that you had your license taken away and you can't drive your car or you, you, you can't afford to have a car. Uh, and so there's actually um, um, reasons that people are not interested in riding, riding bicycles. There are a variety of programs, however, that are sort of chipping away at these issues and trying to create uh, more access to cycling in varying populations. How interesting. Anything else? Yes. Yeah, so there's a question about a slide that showed a green box um, on the road. And um, the green, uh, uh, that, that's a good example of if, if you come up to a crossing, um, the truck in front of you, it may be making a right turn and you may not know it. And if you're actually right next to it, especially if it's a bigger truck, a delivery truck, it could run right into you. Um, the green box is an area that the cyclists will travel into. So um, you might have 10 cyclists sitting in that green box or just one. Um, the car is supposed to stop behind it. And because the green box exists, it visually encourages the cyclists to come up front and place themselves centrally and in front of the car that's waiting for the light to change. And with the bicyclist centrally and in front of the car, they're much less like, the car is going to know the cyclists are there, and they're much less likely to get into accident by hitting them to the right, by turning right by the car. Um, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Just like a closing question, I suppose. Um, do you think that with all, like there's enough, important stakeholders engaged in the mission of bicycling in Denver that it could ever become as bike friendly as Portland? There, uh, the question is whether there are enough leaders engaged in Denver that could ever be as bike friendly as Portland. I am encouraged that this virtuous cycle seems to be not something that happens overnight. Nobody has the political will often to, to spend on something transformative. But um, like my business at KP, after 15, 20 years of doing the work, it slowly transformed itself in terms of prevention and public health at KP. Um, so I am encouraged. Uh, we have one bike bicycle pedestrian coordinator uh, for a number of years in Denver. They're hiring two more this year, and they're putting a lot more of uh, these kinds of bike facilities in the city. So uh, I think this, and, and city council seems to be much more proactive around it. So I don't know if we'll get to the Portland level, but we are certainly recognizing it's an economic driver. It attracts young people, um, and it makes for a uh, a public realm that's more comfortable and more beautiful. So I think the city will make lots of changes in the next 20 years. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Dr. Thanks. Feel free to grab.
another sandwich or some cookies or something.